Hi everyone, I'm Sakit Pridashi. I'm the Associate Medical Director for Alcohol and Drugs uh, Re Recovery Services in Glasgow, Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board. Many thanks to lots of people who've contributed to the work that I'm about to present to you today, <clears throat> in particularly to the staff and the patients at uh, the Enhanced Drug Treatment Service where we deliver heroin-assisted treatment. I'm going to call it diamorphine-assisted treatment from now, now onwards, okay? I wanted to take a little diversion though before we did that, just we've, for once I'm able to present some positive news. It feels like the first time in years. Um, this is the suspected drug-related deaths in the Greater Glasgow Police Division, the majority of which is Glasgow City. Um, this is provisional figures, and hopefully the National Records of Scotland will confirm the trend that this is showing in August this year. So you can see the sort of skyline graph uh, bars there are the uh, deaths, suspected drug-related deaths per quarter, and the, uh, the line at the top is the cumulative for the last four quarters. And you can see that hopefully, hopefully there's some indication that there may have been a peak in drug-related deaths in 2020, early 2021. And certainly in Glasgow City, we've seen over a 30% reduction in drug-related deaths, in, 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 in suspected drug-related deaths in 2022 compared to 2021 comes with many caveats, including if you look at the last bar, you'll see that there's a slight rise there, unfortunately. So we've got to monitor this very carefully, and that's why we've got to be, not be complacent and still be implementing new interventions, including drug checking and drug consumption facilities in the city as well. The Enhanced Drug Treatment Service, where we deliver diamorphine-assisted treatment, is just one aspect of a system of care that we have in the city. Many of you will be involved in that. It's very difficult to say that the reduction in suspected drug-related deaths has been the result of any individual intervention. It might be just not related at all. It might be due more to drug trends or change in risk behaviors for other reasons. But at the same time, we have been implementing a whole range of interventions um, prior, continuing to prioritize naloxone, particularly through the new wand service, the police involved in naloxone supply now. We even, we even trained and uh, elected members on naloxone recently as well. We've got a crisis outreach service, which is really sort of a crucial part of the infrastructure. I can't believe we didn't have it before because that's telling us that in the first six months of their operation, they reached out to 800 individuals who had uh, experienced a near fatal overdose and were referred to them and they, they assertively outreached to them. We, we have 36 beds in our residential stabilization and crisis services. We've been busy implementing the MAP standards. We almost have 1,000 people in Glasgow City on long-acting injectable buprenorphine, which has been extremely popular and we think probably has a significant sort of sa a safety profile as an o OST. And we've slowly but surely been increasing benzodiazepine prescribing for people on OST as well. So the Enhanced Drug Treatment Service is a part of an, an, a system which includes all this, and hopefully we're beginning to see some green shoots of, of improvement and recovery for people in our, in our city. But the, our service, the service I'm going to talk to you about, its origins really in, are from the HIV outbreak in 2015 and 16, which we discovered was happening in people who were injecting in public places like this, injecting heroin, cocaine. And when we, when we actually investigated that population, what we discovered is that they had really tried virtually all the treatments that were available to them, but we wanted to implement new things in the city, and heroin-assisted treatment and a safer drug consumption facility were two of the proposals that were approved by the city's integrated joint board in 2017. And so we're very lucky here. We have, we have this service. Uh, there's a picture of it with our nurse team leader there. We have four booths where people inject prescribed diamorphine 
under supervision. They're not allowed to take any doses away. People would come twice a day to begin with, and over time they sort of reduce that down if they're, if they're doing well and want to do so. It's open uh, seven days a week, three, six, five days a year. Um, it's open nine to five. It has a dispensary just uh, just to the side of where um, Jill, the nurse team leader, is, um, and and a consultation room there where, as well. A multidisciplinary team of nurses, doctors, a psychologist, a pharmacy team, and, and admin support, co-located in Hunter Street Health Services, crucially with the whole range of um, uh, services that this population needs as well. So these were the service aims and these were the specific outcomes we're looking for. We can share that in the presentation. Um, the service has been up and running now for over three years. We've been subject to two evaluations, a GGC-led um, service evaluation really on the outcomes for individual patients and uh, an independent CSO-funded <laughs> service implementation evaluation, which has been led by Glasgow Caledonian University and some colleagues, Andy McCauley, Matt uh, Smith are here. I'm sure I saw them earlier. But both, both have concluded. Um, reports will come out very shortly, hopefully, very soon, so you'll be able to see that. So what I'm gonna share with you today is just some of the very sort of high-level findings and reflections on what it's been like to deliver this service uh, over the last few years. <clears throat> so the first thing to say is what we've found is that the people attending our service have very significant complex needs and actually much more complex needs than people previously studied in uh, in uh, injectable opiate treatment studies. So the RIOT study, the randomized injectable treatment um, study, which was done in uh, England, London, and other uh, centers, uh, was a randomized controlled trial. And you can see that our patient group uh, have a longer length of time in uh, drug use. They've had, um, uh, for, for, if you look at, for example, I don't want to go through all of them, but if you look at homelessness, all of our patients uh, uh, were homeless on admission to this service. If you look at the prison um, data, it tells you that n none of our patients had not ever been in prison, and a third of them had been actually in prison more than 20 times. And for all, all, almost any uh, indicator for complex needs, our population is much more severe, if you like, than uh, the, the, the studies from London. And equally, when we compare our, our cohort with the NESI cohort from 2019, GGC, NESI being the National in, uh, Needle um, Exchange Surveillance Initiative, um, again, it shows that the population we're dealing with is much more complex needs, and therefore, we actually are recruiting the population we wanted to based on the evidence we gathered for after the HIV outbreak. What we found was that actually people do reduce the street heroin use dramatically, um, and that's both in self-reported and in urine testing, um, and that's very much in keeping with the studies found elsewhere. However, the, the reduction in cocaine use, as, uh, and mo almost everybody who came in, well, everybody who came in was a poly drug using uh, individual, and the reductions in cocaine use weren't quite as profound as the reductions in street heroin use, and certainly self-reported, but self-reported cocaine use did reduce significantly, and self-reported injecting and injecting related harms linked to cocaine use reported uh, r reduced significantly as well. There was a very significant reduction in atizolam use, both in self-reporting and in laboratory drug screening. Um, atizolam is a really interesting one because it's probably the, the one that causes greatest risk in terms of adding dimorphine on top of. 
And so people very quickly understood that if they present and attend with etizolam, then there's a risk to their doses, but also a risk to themselves in terms of overdosing. And we prescribe di diazepam as, as a substitute. People report self, uh, significant improvements in their health, um, and this includes not just reduction in injecting-related harms and other health uh, uh, parameters, but uh, a reduction in overdoses, which we can see in emergency department-linked data, um, so, uh, and, and a reduction in presentations to emergency departments and hospitals for injecting and drug-related matters. Reduced homelessness and reductions in begging, rough sleeping, and illegal activity as a source of income. Improvement in personal circumstances and health and social functioning. As I said, a reduction in emergency departments and hospital admissions. And very few significant adverse events, which is very important in terms of uh, this, this safety profile of this intervention. I'm just going to show you. You know, there's, when the report comes out, you'll be able to feast on graphs and data and stuff. I'm just going to show you, pick out just a handful of them as illustrative of what I've been describing. So first of all, diamorphine dosing. Uh, our average doses are about 240 milligrams uh, per injection, keeping very much in line with international literature. In the background, people have methadone for overnight uh, dosing. An example of self-reported heroin use, you can see that on, at baseline, when people came into treatment, uh, we, uh, they were using heroin every day, but at the end of 12 months of treatment, um, that had reduced very, very significantly, and that matched uh, toxicology as well. And not, it's not just the days, but the amount of money people are spending on heroin reduced very significantly as well. And it was similar for cocaine, but not to the same extent, not nearly to the same extent. And this is a gradual, so we, we, we spoke to people as baseline at three months, six months, and 12 months of their treatment. And this tells you, this shows you um, the reductions in the weekly amount of, uh, average weekly amount of money they spend on drug use. Some data on what happens to, uh, in hospital admissions. So you can see that in the year before starting diamorphine assisted treatment, the cohort that we had 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 162 days in hospital between them. And after, during a year of treatment, they only had 33. And it's not just the re reduction in the days but also in um, a, a reduction in the length of time that they were in hospital for any ad admission as well. And that translates in the acute sector at least to quite significant reductions in costs for our colleagues in emergency departments and in the wards. So for people who actually completed a year of treatment, it, uh, there was over a 70% reduction in the costs estimated costs that the acute services would have experienced. We actually m measured the impact on people who didn't complete a year of treatment. We followed them up for a year as well, and they accrued some benefit from ev ever having been in, uh, in, on diamorphine-assisted treatment. So people who couldn't maintain treatment were all discharged transferred to partner services where treatment was continued no, and nobody disengaged or fell away from treatment. But very interestingly and very unfortunately, two people out of a small number of people who were discharged died dr uh, a drug-related death. Nobody in on diamorphine treatment uh, has, has, uh, has died as, as yet. And hopefully that will be the case. I'm going to touch wood right now. Um, our, 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 our whole practice about discharging, therefore, has kind of changed. Our thresholds change. We really want to work with people, give them a second chance, third chance, maybe even a fourth chance to re-engage with the service. 
before moving them on because this is a complex need a population with a very high risk profile and a very high risk of poor outcomes if not on this treatment. A few, a few sort of reflection on some of the challenges around delivering this service if you're thinking about it. The first thing is don't implement a service in the middle of an international pandemic. Yeah, okay, so the, um, March 22 was three three months after, uh, or three or four months after our first patient initiated uh, diamorphine. And it's really cost us about 18 months and possibly more in terms of, uh, in terms of the progress of the service. Second, I'm gonna jump forward to staffing, which is the last box there. It's a very intensive service. It's a seven days a week commitment. Um, it's not for everybody. Uh, people have a very high um, levels of trauma experience in our patient group. They've got poor experience of how they've been treated by health and social work services in the past. So the behaviors can be challenging and difficult. And so in order to maintain a sort of therapeutic engagement and a trauma and psychologically informed approach, it, you, you really need the right people working on the floor. Um, and the intensity is not for everyone, so there's been a significant turnover and COVID has impacted that, as you will all know from your, your own services as well. So that staffing has been a very significant challenge. In terms of outcomes for people, people can, do continue to use um, some benzodiazepines, but often cocaine. And that does limit us in terms of the extent of outcomes we can expect for folk, but they also have very complex needs as, as, as well. And that links in with you know, our expectation beforehand was that we would give people three months of trial treatment. If they were engaging, we would give them a year of full treatment to stabilize, and then in the second year of treatment, we would try and help people progress onto other relevant services. Actually, our experience hasn't that been borne out by that. In, in, in the real world, it, uh, it, we, we've had to continue people in treatment for longer and progress is slower, and that reflects a whole range of issues, uh, including their own uh, individual person-centered um, needs. Co-location with other services has been crucial, but the services that we've been co-located with have also undergone their own changes. And so, for example, you, you might have heard that the homeless GP practice is now no longer there. Um, so we, we're still sort of figuring out how we move forward with the right services in the building. So in conclusion, uh, we can say that for a very small number of people, but a growing number of people, we've been able to implement diamorphine-assisted treatment safely and effective and, and the, key, the, the outcomes have been very much in keeping with what would be, we would expect from the evidence base, even though in a very complex needs, uh, real world, Glasgow city center population. Um, there have been a whole range of challenges um, that we, we have reflected on. I would urge you to read the CSO report in particular, because if you're thinking about setting up services, some of the nuance of that challenge, some of, the, um, some of the learning from our own services will be more contained in that than the uh, GGC so outcome-based report. And I do hope that, as Tessa mentioned, that you know, we can add drug checking facility and a safer drug consumption facility to the infrastructure that we're creating in, in Glasgow to tackle the epidemic of deaths. Okay, thank you very much.